Uh, g'day. Well, this is, this is surreal. Uh, I'm sitting there, I'm on that list of blogs. Um, uh, on, on, in really good company too, I'm proud to say. I, uh, I'm not a social psychologist and my blog is about methods uh, beyond that, but it's a, it was quite an interesting experience. Uh, I put the, I'm going to be talking about post-publication peer review, uh, but post-publication more broadly and what happens, uh, and I'll probably refer back to a few things. Uh, but I think this first uh, little cartoon of mine that I've put there about somebody looking at a paper and thinking the results are intriguing, and the other one thinking utter claptrap, um, it's actually quite an important uh, place to start because it, it's a reminder of the fact of just how subjective a lot of these decisions, uh, a lot, uh, opinions, in fact, are. I'm yeah. Move, you can do this. What am I not? F oh, I'm failing at the technology already. I'm pressing the green arrow and a little green light's coming on but nothing's happening. I wonder why. Oh, that's gone way too far. Now every single press I did has showed up at once. Sorry. This is a, I will get there. <sighs> As you can see, this is a cartoon-heavy uh, thing. Get back. I have to go back because this is important. Uh, no, this is okay. I'm, I'm, I'm good now, I, I hope. Yeah, uh, thanks. It's, it's me. Uh, so the first is a disclaimer. Uh, I work at the NCBI that runs PubMed, the big uh, biomedical literature database at the National Institutes of Health, but the views that I will express are all my own uh, and, may, uh, and may well sort of be disagreed with by many. If I'm going to say something that really is uh, the opinion of uh, the NIH, I will specifically say that. My disclosure is uh, that when I get into this area about talking about post-publication is that uh, I'm the lead editor of PubMed Commons, uh, a post-publication, the post-publication commenting system inside PubMed. Uh, this is an important place that I, uh, for me that uh, that several other people like uh, like Isabel Bouton have already raised while we've been here, is that what are we talking about? We've had a, a kind of history of thinking that we we'll say things like people published a study. Um, you can't publish a study. A study is a really quite very complex uh, endeavour. Uh, and you can, and our publication is sort of one artifact uh, of, a, of a study, and there's just an enormous amount of different materials and perspectives and events and artifacts that, are, that lie behind studies, especially quite large ones. Um, but we've had this, this idea that's, that's stuck around for a long time because there's been this kind of historical method of how people communicated science results. And I've kind of crunched it down here. You would have a manuscript which centuries ago uh, there would be like a reading at the society of it and if it sort of got through that process then it would be, uh, then it would be published. Now often uh, people are presenting uh, results uh, as just, just happened uh, right before me. Um, and then you have this process of a, a, what was originally very closed individualistic peer review process. It was typically one or two people. Uh, and then, uh, to a very large extent, despite the fact that there was a lot of conversation between people and letters going backwards and forwards, literally in satchels on the backs of horses and so on originally, uh, to a very large extent that the scholarly discourse was regarded essentially as happening pub publication to publication. So somebody publishes this peer-reviewed article and then somebody makes some kind of peer-reviewed criticism and the, and the process goes on. And, as everything else has been changing around this, there's been this has been one of the kind of parts of the process that's actually been uh, that's actually really quite uh, quite contested, uh, and people are really split about. Some people still really feel this is the the norm, and and a large number of people don't. The issue about it being typically one or two is also an interesting thing because in in peer review for grant applications for whatever, I mean that would ordinarily be seen as too small a number. Um, somebody published a paper this week which is actually relevant given what we just heard, talking about how can you rate the quality of blog posts in clinical areas. Uh, and they came to the conclusion that you need at least 42 to get a reasonable consensus of opinion about whether a blog post was of good quality or not. Uh, which gives you an idea to some extent of how random one or two is going to be. The background of this, we've had this increasing collaboration in science that I think is actually really quite an important uh, thing to look at. Still that sort of number of the peer reviewers has stayed constant, but the proportion, but it comes from a time when only one person used to write a paper. By about, what would it be, about 1840, uh, uh, you started to get the first, the very first 
co-authored uh, papers, I've just said 1940 on there, uh, error, we need to correct that. Uh, it was actually about 1840. And, uh, but by a certain amount of time, that's in most disciplines, uh, except perhaps mathematics, uh, single authorships just disappeared. And we're now at the point where it's not unusual to have more than 1,000 authors. And uh, at the same time, there's also been a rise of public attention and media attention in the results of research. So publishing, which is to make public, uh, just started to see an enormous amount of community interest. I, I sort of would put that as, in particular, a really strong one, the rise of the media attention around Rentgen and his x-rays, where it was on the front page of most newspapers before he even read it, got up and stood up and read at the society uh, the results of his work. The technology has sped up, scientific publishing has by and large slowed down, uh, with some exceptions, but that's just a broad historical trend here. I've put above this, uh, this kind of some landmarks to show what was happening in society with the, the, the beginnings of the World Wide Web and the starts of a lot of, of very strong controversies around science and strong feelings in the community about a whole lot of issues. Uh, and that's actually gone very quickly when you look at that from a historical point of view. It was the, by two, in the 2010s before 80% of the US uh, were on the internet. Published research is literally public. Now that looks like a really stupid thing to say, but it's actually quite important uh, to keep in mind when we start to think about how, how do people have these kind of different approaches and what's going to be the possibilities around how post-publication discussion is dealt with. Uh, in this really, really excellent uh, article by medical anthropologists in Medical Anthropology, uh, these researchers point out that the idealised expert generated one way authoritative reign of science is over. Um, I think that's been clear for quite some time to a lot of people, but not to everyone. And it's a very, very difficult kind of social process to negotiate and come to terms with and work out how we deal with it. We've had actually very, very little study, very little rigorous study about the elements of publication and the process and the communication around all those kinds of things. I summarise some of the systematic reviews and the trials from the point of view of looking at the question of uh, openness uh, in, a, in an unpeer-reviewed blog post, uh, but you can see uh, all the things that I've uh, looked at there to, to sort of look at that yourself. And basically there's been very few uh, sort of randomised studies and rigorous studies of comparing closed versus open uh, peer review. The studies that people have done to try to see how you can improve the quality of peer review have not actually really found anything that ha that's been shown to have a real effect. Peer review itself has never been shown to have a really important effect on the quality of studies. Uh, the impact of uh, of blinding and being closed has a small, if any, impact. Open peer reviewers uh, when they're named, they tend to be more careful, more civil. Uh, there's much more sort of aggression and so on in, uh, in closed peer review where people fear no consequences to themselves of what they say. But the being open may deter reviewers. There are some theoretical uh, issues, sort of benefits of openness in the whole process uh, of peer review, regardless of at which point along the life of a publication we're talking. Exposing uh, review of conflicts of interest and journal bias and so on, um, those are things actually that are just not really entirely possible while the system is, is really closed. Uh, one of the others is the issue about building critical skills and we're all going to agree that, that it's important that you, you're able to criticise and that how you do that in a way that's, uh, that gets the point across that people understand and that it's effective and so on is really quite important. Uh, but it can also be an important part of uh, reputation building. And the minute we get into that whole post-publication thing, or the issue of getting published in the first place and then how people respond to people's work, it's, it's all really about how people feel about kind of credit and reputational credit and demerit and those sorts of things, and very strong personal emotions. Um, Susan Visick just was pointing out the, the example of psychological science and their certificate system, and uh, the people involved can correct me if I got this uh, data wrong. But uh, as near as I could see, you had this, uh, uh, a significant minority didn't apply for the badge. You actually have to apply to get one of those, uh, one of those badges. Uh, and it's a really interesting, uh, a really interesting uh, experiment, to kind of, natural experiment to kind of see going on. It's hard to know what to make of it though, because it's one journal, there's small numbers, and uh, we don't know whether what we're seeing, uh, the badges is not the only thing that's going on, so there's a lot of confounding variables. We don't know if that's just a, you know, like a little bit of a stampede of people who, who feel a certain way and want to wear this badge with pride. 
you know, going over to the journal, would that last? Would it work in another field? You know, we really don't know uh, that much about just the badge per se because it's not the kind of study that could show us that. But it's a really interesting, important uh, area to look at. What are the kinds of things that could encourage people to engage in the kind of uh, behaviour that we want? I think in terms of thinking about what happens after a, a publication. There's, a, there's the issue of sort of like the aftercare of a publication and then there's that issue of the ongoing peer review process that no, very few pre-publication peer reviews could remotely be adequate. I mean, if you've, got, if you've got hundreds of people or even just dozens from six or seven disciplines getting together and doing some research, a few uh, peer reviewers can't possibly actually adequately uh, assess, assess that work. And I tend to think of it as the yin and yang, which is the side where people get out and they're building and connecting and applying and expanding. Uh, and then there's the other side where they're correcting uh, their own work sometimes, but also others, refutations, retractions and discrediting uh, studies and methods and so on. For this to be, uh, for this uh, actually to be effective, I think there's a kind of a, this is the, the way that I look at it. I ended up uh, artificially making it all A's, but because uh, it helps me remember. One is it has to be timely. It has to happen as soon as possible because a whole lot of people might be going off and starting a new project and go, well, I'm going to apply this method or I'm going to, to go and apply for a grant to carry on this work. And the, the consequences of papers can be really, really quite severe. In a lot of areas, people will go and they'll make health decisions. All sorts of things are going to happen. Uh, and there can be a lot of social, uh, social results and consequences of going public with research results. So that issue of timeliness, given that uh, the whole process of saying, well, wait for some peer-reviewed process, I mean, that, that inevitably adds uh, quite a stretch of time, especially as we're watching the, the time to publication uh, increasing, uh, as Vale's article in PNS showed. So uh, there is that issue. Then there's the issue of it being accessible. Um, there's quite a lot of public uh, post-publication activity going on that you're just not even going to see if you go to the article or any other place. Then it actually has to be accessed, because remember the way most people deal with literature. Um, they, they'll have a PDF maybe that they stick in their Mendeley collection or, or, or something or on, on their hard drive. They'll, you'll cite it once, and then when you need to cite something in that area again, you go, where's that citation? And you put that you know, out of your reference management system. Whatever. You don't go back and see what's happened to that publication. That's just not the way most people do things. We started a, a, an electronic journal many years ago, uh, Kay Dickinson and, a, and, a, and a, a few others who were here, um, that, that has regular updating. It's a Cochrane uh, database of systematic reviews. Uh, and, and you watch that, no matter how much you, you, you want that, people aren't going back and seeing what's changed uh, in the last two years in that review and so on. Some people do, but it, it's, it's not something that people, that's ordinarily in people's uh, workflow. And then it actually has to be acted on. Um, so that means that uh, if errors are shown, that the errors are corrected, for example. Um, if somebody goes to trouble, to the trouble of, of, of communicating and putting a lot of intellectual effort into, into some kind of post-publication input, uh, that they get some kind of response uh, and that people who are going to go on and cite the work take it into account. And when you start to actually look at it from that point of view, uh, there's, a, there's, an, there's, an enormous, uh, there's enormous kind of barriers to, uh, that we really need to deal with. Now, I did this cartoon about science being self-correcting, which is kind of a bit of an editor's in-joke. But, uh, but, but I actually think it's really quite important to, to consider, OK, we have those things that we believe and that, that are aspirational. Uh, and to what extent are they a reality, especially from discipline to discipline? Uh, and that can really change a lot. We don't have a lot of uh, evidence about this, but uh, Ginny Barber yesterday was talking about the example of the British Medical Journal, which has uh, a, very, a very unique situation because what you've got there is a, uh, a, a very clear kind of clientele that uses research. It's the doctors in the NHS that are members of the British Medical Association. And this historically is their journal, and uh, it's a very, very, very important kind of water cooler that everybody gets, gets around uh, uh, and has this kind of a tradition to it. And this one analysis of letters to the editor found that in terms of rapid responses for the actual research reports, 88% had at least some kind of uh, rapid response to it. 30% uh, of the research papers had what were deemed to be very substantive criticisms. Uh, less than half the time did the authors respond. Um, and if you went to start to look at, well, how often did, did really serious uh, problems shall actually end up 
in an errata or so on, uh, it's not going to be anything like 30%, because obviously the, the, the rate of errata and is, is kind of more down like 1% or 2%. What about the idea that, that doing this sort of stuff behind the scenes and not out in the open is effective? We don't really have any reason to think that that's how things work. Vines recently showed that data disappeared in, uh, in his field at the rate of 17% a year. It disappears in all sorts of ways. It's on technology that nobody any, any longer has access to. Somebody's moved on and despite huge amounts of efforts, you can't track where on earth they are on the planet anymore. Um, uh, people sort of have, somebody was in the lab temporarily and was responsible for X, Y and uh, Z, and now they've long gone and nobody knows uh, where they are. They may even have got married and changed their name and no one can track them down. All sorts of, all sorts of reasons why data disappears, but it disappears uh, really quite quickly. In psychology, Vichitz shows that uh, in, a, in a quite large project, that they had a 73% non-response rate to requests for data. Uh, and I've put as a kind of a shorthand for the, the experience that systematic reviewers go to when they go to ask authors for extra information uh, or to do uh, individual patient data meta-analyses, just how enormously difficult it is to get, uh, to get uh, answers to questions from researchers years after they've done work. So where are we at with this, the, the, the issue of the post-publication kind of process? I've stuck my little journal guy up there to, to, to sort of represent uh, the peer reviews and then the, the Twitter logo down the bottom to represent that whole uh, social media kind of world. And I, that, I may not have them all here, but this is the, the sort of the main array of platforms that exist they have a very large component that's around offering post-publication, a platform for post-publication peer review. BioArchive actually goes up there now, I think, with the BMJ for, for success in, in getting people to actually comment, because they've got a 10% rate of commenting, which when, once you start to look at these kind of percentages and really look at what's happening in terms of errata and, and all those kinds of things, uh, you start to see the, the, the percentage matters. Uh, but it's also like which percent, uh, everything doesn't need to be commented on, everything doesn't have a problem. And, uh, so you want people to be commenting on the things where it's going to do some good and, and there's a point to it. But nevertheless, the, the, the raw percentage gives you some sort of an idea. I mean, I think 10% is probably rather low for, for what you would actually really like ultimately to see, but it's, it's, it's very substantial. And uh, to some extent that could be too because people can see a point presumably. I mean, whether this lasts over time, uh, we don't know, but uh, as it upscales, but uh, you, you, you can presume if somebody's put a preprint uh, that they actually, it's not too late to change uh, um, what they've done and they may be willing to. So uh, that may be one of the, the social factors behind it. But for all the rest of, all the rest of them, and I would include PubMed Commons, uh, where I work, it's very, very small. Uh, all of them are, are very small in relation to sort of the quantity of, of literature, and some of them have got sort of particular areas of, of, of this particular discipline. It's a part of that or a subset has caught on on a particular platform or whatever, but they tend to be very small, and then they're not in the places where people are actually going, uh, unless you're a real aficionado of it, and, and with the exception of PubMed and probably ResearchGate to, to some extent, where people are going to get literature when they're looking for literature so that they would stumble upon it. I'll say a few things about PubMed Commons. Um, PubMed Commons was developed in response to scientific community interest, and the reason that the NIH ultimately uh, wanted to go ahead and do this, but to do it very carefully with a whole lot of piloting first, was because on the one hand there were these concerns about effectively turning uh, PubMed into Facebook or YouTube or, or something or other, and wasting people's time, and, and would it be worth it? The ultimate decision, the, the ultimate sort of really decisive factor for the NIH in doing it was to say, look, uh, the NIH funds an awful lot of publicly f uh, you know, uh, research with public money and people should be able to, to raise criticisms and concerns about uh, at any time, regardless of whether the, the journal accepts letters to the editor or doesn't have them at all or shuts them off over a period of time or rejects the letters to the editor and so on. Um, that openness of the research, uh, the public had a, had a right to be able to to be 
confident that people's concerns about uh, about NIH funded research were actually able to get out there to be seen. The sort of some criteria around which uh, it was developed, one that you had to be an author of a publication in PubMed to be able to comment, no anonymous accounts, no pseudonyms. There's post comment moderation only, uh, and uh, with the exception of a, a kind of quick filter, automatic filter that goes through, uh, and then you comment and it's a Creative Commons license that you've agreed to. It began in October 2013, and we've basically got to the position that we think we do have a sustainable infrastructure that minimises uh, potentially harmful use of the forum. That was one of the main uh, criteria that the NIH had for this. Uh, some would criticise whether we've achieved that, but essentially uh, we think uh, we have, and the feedback seems to be, by and large, that people think so. The quality of the comments is high, the use of the comments is low. Um, the, and the important thing to sort of understand here too is that in that the conversation about comments and so on happens elsewhere. Mostly there's just one or perhaps two comments uh, in PubMed Commons on a particular article. It's not a place that people really discuss things, they discuss things elsewhere. Um, so it ends up being about four publications a day uh, that are getting, uh, that, are, that are being commented on. And so you have, uh, you have quite a, a wide range of commenters uh, quite a, a wide range of types of articles being commented on, um, but not necessarily a lot of comments, which is not, uh, we don't think is a bad thing. We introduced in 2014 journal club membership, so group, uh, the first kind of group membership uh, that we've introduced, uh, which has had a small take up, but they comment more consistently and it's high quality. I think that this is a really important reminder of the fact that we have a huge amount of intellectual activity that goes on in response to reading publications uh, that we don't necessarily see. Um, people will often then say, well, I'm gonna keep that criticism, I'll stick it in the discussion section of my next paper or uh, whatever, which they may or may not do, but may never really be linked back with people who are looking at, at that paper and they never actually see that. We have uh, just a wide range of uh, different forms of of intellectual activity that are going on that you'd actually have to really uncover. So you're, uh, if you've done a clinical trial, there's, there's quite a good chance by a certain point that it's been very rigorously analysed in a systematic review, um, but you, you may not necessarily find that so easily. The comments appear below the abstracts if you, if you haven't seen them. Uh, because there's so few, you, you uh, could be uh, use PubMed a lot and not uh, stumble across one. We've done some analyses and we'll be publishing more uh, later this year, but the typical, uh, the typical comment is, is going to be adding discussion or critique or information, not conversation, as I said. Uh, about one in five is posted by authors, but the author reply rate is low. So authors are doing a lot of curating their own work. Um, the rate of women commenting is, 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 seems to be underrepresented. There's a lot of linking to data or code. Critique is a, is, a, is a big chunk of it. Uh, trying to get uh, information is a big chunk, but we don't have a lot of people doing the Facebook thing of saying, uh, gee, that paper's great. Uh, and you can see these later, there's a link in there that to, to where all of this is available online. Uh, authors are, are curating their own work a bit more than they're actually replying to comments by others. But now we're kind of, working and taking a real perspective on post-publication activity overall in PubMed and what are all of the kinds of things. We've had a, a, a history of people tending to study things like uh, retractions and uh, findings of research fraud and so on, which are actually a minuscule part of post-publication activity. It's less than half a percent of uh, what's in PubMed. Um, the, the real kind of bulk of what's happening is, is the things like uh, uh, letters to the editor and errata and those kinds of things. That's, 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 the really big, uh, that's the really big area. And we're starting to go through uh, working on analysing what these are, what the implications of them are and so on, to, to be able to put a lot of this in perspective and find ways that we can develop tools that address some of those things I talked to about earlier. What could actually get this into people's workflows and, and those kinds of things? That's what we're really looking at. How can we do it better? One of the first things that we're doing is tagging uh, editorial expressions of concern in PubMed, uh, which will be coming soon. 
And here you see the, the, the rise in it. It's still a very unusual thing to do, but uh, there is a real rise in the use of, uh, of this mechanism by journals. This gives you a bit of a sense of the overall proportion of these things. Uh, letters and comments are the, the really big bulk. Um, errata, corrections, concerns, that's actually still really a quite a substantial quantity. But those other kinds of uh, events are actually uh, very rare in the literature. Just for people who aren't familiar with it, we're talking about, about 1.2 million publications a year. So what deters open post-publication activity? Um, there's a lot of things said about this, uh, including sometimes what reports of people saying, like, like we just heard that thing, I left the profession because, or I want to leave the profession because, uh, which, which there may be all, so, all sorts of other things going on, um, and we don't really have a lot of evidence to kind of give us the sense of what proportion are all the different possible things that could be contributing to this there. There could be a lack of confidence, there could be the issue of I'm just not motivated and I, I you know, there's the issue of time, uh, and especially when you're putting your name on it, uh, then that actually really becomes a real issue because you know, people do have a concern about their reputations. And then there's the issue of fear of retribution. And what proportion of these things actually, uh, these actually are features is, is hard to tell. I personally think uh, likely it's more the issues of motivation, time, uh, and lack of confidence than it is fear. Uh, but, uh, but I can't. Uh, I can't really point to anything that can satisfy, that can satisfactorily answer that. Uh, a paper's just been published by this group in a journal called Electronic Markets where they've looked at, at something that had a very low response rate to the actual survey that they did. So that's, that's less than, than useful really and they were looking at a hypothetical situation about how people would feel about a, a system that they set, that they proposed that was a little bit like F1000 research or something like that or, a, or that you just publish your papers on ResearchGate or whatever. It's a little bit like that. So I don't know that that was that helpful but I found this really a useful framework that they, that they put up for saying well these are the kinds of of issues coming out of institutional theory and how people adopt uh, adopt uh, certain behaviours uh, that would uh, that would influence to how people would feel about undertaking uh, social peer review. That's a performance expectancy. Will it help me? How much effort it is? Uh, whether uh, peers are doing it, that whole normative thing, whether it, it, the facilities, are, whether the conditions just actually encourage you to do this. Do you get any pleasure or enjoyment out of it? Um, what's the sort of opportunity cost to you, if or are there actual costs? Uh, and has it become a habit? Can it become a habit? I think there are several things that would encourage uh, more open post-publication activity. Collaborative commenting, I think, is one, and we'll be releasing some, some work that we've been doing on that, because that's a, a, a growing thing in PubMed Commons. Uh, author engagement. I mean, people often talk about incentives, uh, and I think that that thing of knowing, if you knew that people were actually going to reply, they were going to give you the answer to the information, give the extra data, uh, whatever, uh, that inherently is an incentive uh, to do it. If you just think you're bashing your head against a brick wall, um, then why waste your time? Uh, recognition, which is something that people talk about a fair bit, and consequences, uh, that it's actually worthwhile, that if you identify important errors, that they are actually corrected, those sorts of, those sorts of things, I think. Uh, I didn't realise that the standard slide that I keep uh, using with these poster childs, I was going to meet uh, all of the authors of one of these comments uh, uh, here, so that, that's uh, really cool. Uh, uh, but this is an example of, pe of that process that just didn't start to unfold in PubMed Commons of people getting together to, to comment uh, on, on particular work, uh, sometimes doing an enormous amount of, of work behind it before they do it too. And I, my tendency looking at that, that overall historical arc is that this is actually where we're going. This notion of peer review as an individual thing that one person does and virtually feels like they've got to chew it up and swallow the paper after they're finished and be so secret about it. Uh, and do it on their own and not talk to anybody. I think, I think that that's something that comes from the 1700s and uh, will not survive, cannot survive, and I also think it should not survive, but that's very much a personal uh, opinion. Uh, and based on uh, my reading of the, the research that we've seen so far, but I also think it's, it's just uh, the way that society is going generally. And I think it should, should be and will be collaborative. 
So then we come, and I'll just finish with a few slides on this whole issue about the culture of criticism, because that's something I've been writing about for a while, and uh, and it is a really critical issue. This uh, flak jacket cartoon is one I actually did when I was responding to uh, to Susan Fisk's uh, blog post with all the name calling about people uh, like us, and uh, and I, I having kind of looked at a lot of this and looked at a lot of responses to what goes on online and how people respond and what they complain about in public commons and so on. I think we've actually got two angles to look at here and they are equally important and they're both sides of this process. One of those is less defensiveness. Um, sometimes you see people get very upset about a criticism and then you look at the criticism and then you, you you cannot, for the life of you, understand the emotional response to a very mild, dry, factual statement that isn't even, isn't even indicating a very big flaw. Uh, uh, and it's a, an incredible overreaction. So I think that we have, yes, it's clear that we have a problem with ad hominem attack, but we also have a problem with what I call ad hominem response. Um, just because you've taken something personally doesn't mean it was personal. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's something that I think is actually a much bigger problem than the unconstructive criticism side. Uh, that's m my perception of it in any event at this point. Uh, I think that people will become less aggressive and more aggressive people will uh, gain less traction if there's more responsiveness to legitimate concerns expressed uh, politely. Um, that, that kind of when people get stonewalled and so on, that can push them, you know, to become more and more radical over time and so on. Uh, and I think openness um, will help. I love this one. This is a, an all-purpose quote, really, that represents something that's inherent to these kinds of things around communication technologies and changes in so social uh, mores around communication and technology and so on. You can take this person's comment and put whatever you want in those square brackets. You could put tweets, blogs, you know, whatever, and it would work. Uh, is there anywhere on earth exempt from these swarms of? This is who it is. This is 1508, and that's Erasmus. Um, he's upset about the Gutenberg press. Uh, and it's actually really a, a, an interesting thing to read. He's concerned about the predatory uh, printers and the, the crappy books and all these, uh, you know, and truly, who can improve on Aristotle and so on. Uh, and I mean, I'm an enormous admirer of Erasmus. Don't don't, don't get me wrong. It's why I, I had looked, uh, I had read this. Uh, but I think it's that typical process. He couldn't envisage. I don't think he thought actually it was going to be the end of civilization. Truly, he believed the book easily published would end Western civilization. And well, that's what he wrote uh, at that point in 1508. Um, but he couldn't envisage that we were going to work this out, that libraries were going to develop and there would be cataloguing systems and you know, all these kinds of things that, that at a certain point, uh, it takes some time to deal with the kind of new disruption, but at a certain point, uh, you, things change and you work, you work on. I think generation is actually a really, really large part of all of this. And, People who particularly who have succeeded in a, in a system, any system, done very well by it and gone quite a long way, uh, can, sometimes, can sometimes just not understand the depth of problems that there are with that system for other people and the need for it to change. Uh, Robert Merton wrote a really good work on this early on that I, th I think is, I find very, very helpful. And one of the things that he said that why disputes between scientists have always been, and I mean, his collection is something to see. I mean, what the, the trash these people talked about each other was just uh, puts Twitter to shame, actually. Uh, and he said that it was actually part of the, it's the, the, the whole level of science culture and how passionately fe people feel about their work. Um, consequently, this is why they so overreact to criticism and, uh, uh, and to, to their work not perhaps being taken in high regard. Um, I, have this, I still hold the distinction I checked yesterday. I've been the only person who ever got the word wackaloon into PMC or PubMed. Um, but I, 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 I think that that process of how do we get there, I worked for a time when I was a teenager in courtrooms and uh, that, that uh, hence the, the, the barrister with the wig and all that kind of stuff, saying, with all due respect, Your Honour, my learned friend is a wackaloo. Uh, there are, people have, in all sorts of situations where there's a real lot of conflict, they work to develop the mores for how you do this and so on. I think 
my personal experience, science is, is less good at that than others. I think partly because they pretend that's not what they're like, that they're collegial, you know, uh, uh, but conflict is, is enormous. And this is really hard for the public as well, and several people have pointed that out uh, as we go. Things get really tense for the townsfolk when the third meta-analyst gang rides into town. And we have to get, get better at not just having that stuff that only people in the know understand which is the valid criticism, which is, uh, which is, which is uh, less so. And I think to some extent it comes down to really going back to that process of deciding what are our values, uh, what values do we want scientists to have, I feel quite strongly that generosity in science is one of the things that we really need to keep making a, a large commitment to. Uh, in that, I would put things like diversity, openness, fairness, sharing, giving, collaboration and service. Um, less so perhaps than some of the other things that I think uh, it's, it's very, very easy uh, to, to have swamp those things. Uh, and that would be uh, my crisper plea. Can we uh, get the hubris out and more generosity in? Thank you.